today, we are going to stir it up. Man, I'm so glad that you have joined us today as we launch into a brand new series, Moving Forward. And there are some of you who are thinking, I don't know what stir it up means, but I am so thankful to have a conversation about moving forward because I am so done with this. Can we just move on and get past this thing we have called COVID-19? And I want to I want to challenge you to stop just for a second and pause. Don't miss the opportunity we have to learn, discover, grow. Don't, don't go rushing back to what it was just because of what it was without pausing to ask the question, is there anything that ought to change? Is there anything that I formerly did that I need to stop doing or limit? What is it that God is teaching me in this season that will make the new normal, actually better than the old normal. And for some of you, you're like, man, that's great to talk about moving forward, but I'm not in a good place to move forward right now. And for some of you, COVID-19 is still real. Tina lost her mom this week because of this nasty, deadly virus. And many have reached out to us and said, In this isolation, I am not mentally healthy. I am not spiritually healthy. I'm not even physically healthy in this mess. And then we even had conversation with business owners who are struggling because in the midst of everything going on, they can't even get their workers to show up because those workers are better off on unemployment benefits. And so here we have this just this messy craziness of trying to support one another and encourage one another. But let me challenge you while still in the throes of the mess that you would by faith look up ahead because it is coming. The end is coming. And now is the time for us to ask the question of, okay, next what? What should look different? What can I learn? Even in the midst of the storm. So today we, we launch into this discussion about moving forward and let's, let's start here, like right here. I, I am sitting in the middle of our worship center in the old Marion Walmart building that we bought back in 2012. But for the last 11 weekends, the doors have been locked. Like we bought this building to be able to invite hundreds of people to come and gather to worship God, but it ain't been happening here. I'm here and you're there, wherever there is. We've not been able to worship, which presents a really interesting question. Why why do we gather in a large gathering with with hundreds of people? why, Why do we do that? Because the truth is, if we cannot answer that question, then when we invite a friend and they say, why? We don't know the answer. Or when we find ourselves in a place, maybe we've been offended or put off or we're just tired. It is so easy to say, me, Jesus in a tree stand. I think that's good enough. Or when our teenager says, mom, I'm not going. We don't even have an answer better than get in the car. And our teenagers deserve something more when we are explaining to them why. Now, Opening the church doors has been a real hot button issue. Like it, it has been something that people are changing their Facebook profiles to church is essential. I've heard many times people quoting Hebrews 10, 25. This says, don't miss church. Now, what, what I want to do is I want you to take a look at this passage and then we're going to back up and answer the question of, okay, why is it that We're not supposed to miss church. So here they are. Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit. So some people are skipping church and they're not supposed to do that. But the passage doesn't tell us to not skip church. It actually tells us why to not miss church. Actually, in this passage, there are three imperatives, three calls to action that actually happen when we gather together. So here's here's the deal. When we understand why we gather together, normally in, in large gatherings, 
we can be ready to go back. And also we can figure out how to do church even in smaller groups, like right there in your home, right there with the people you're with today, if we can figure out the why we do this and why we do that. So we're going to take a look at this in entire passage and kind of sort through what's going on. So are you ready? Go ahead and grab your Bible or turn on your, your app and let's take a look at this incredible passage. Now I got to warn you, this is a hard one. Like, like the whole book of Hebrews is, is a little bit difficult to read. Like if you jump in and read it, you're probably going to find yourself a little bit encumbered because you don't understand. You, you don't know the Old Testament story as well as they did. And you probably are not familiar with the imagery. So when you read it, it's complicated just because you're not familiar with the pictures. But once you see the pictures, the passage comes to life. So let's jump into the passage in verse 19, 20, and 21. In this section, we get three really important images. Holy places, curtain, and priest. Let me tell you about those three. Holy places is pointing to the holy of holies. So for God's people in Jerusalem, they had the temple And at the very core of the temple, they had the Holy of Holies. Like that was the place that God's presence was manifest in a beautiful way. Ark of the Covenant. I mean, just this incredible place where God's presence dwelled. Curtain. Separating the Holy of Holies from everything else was a really thick, plush, beautiful curtain. It separated and protected God's people from his manifest presence. Third, priest. Back then, they had a priest who was their person. Like, he's my person. He helps me connect with God. Like, I have to have the priest in order to connect with God. Now, let's put those three together. Once a year, the high priest, on behalf of all the people, would pull back the curtain and enter into the holy of holies. One person, one time a year into the manifest presence of God. It was awesome for him to be able to go in. And it was um, really terrifying to go in. They even tied a rope to the guy's leg in case he didn't get adequately prepared because you can't take sin into the presence of God. And so if he didn't get all the preparations done, like being in the presence of God would strike him dead. So they were ready in case the little bell on his leg quit jiggling, they would pull him out. One person, once a year, into the presence of God. Now, when you understand those three images, then you understand the beauty of what this passage is teaching us about what God has invited us into, which is so much more. By the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, this phrase summarizes the life of death, and resurrection of Christ. His entire mission. Jesus came and lived perfectly, died sacrificially, and proved that he pulled it off by being raised from the dead on Sunday. He lived perfectly, meaning he did for you what you could not do in a hundred tries. He died sacrificially, meaning he died in your place. His blood was a payment for your sins. His life for your life. His sinlessness for your sinfulness. And then on Easter Sunday, he proved that he had declared victory over sin and death for us. The blood of Jesus represents the gospel. Because of the blood of Jesus, he opened for us through the curtain. So remember, high priest pulling it back. And maybe you remember this part of the Easter story. Maybe you've been at church on Easter Sunday most years. And you've heard the part of the story where when Jesus died on the cross, the temple veil tore from top to bottom. And in the past, you've thought, that's kind of cool. Not sure why, but it, it sounds pretty cool. It was so much more than just a neat little indication of what Jesus accomplished. It was a beautiful picture of the miracle Jesus accomplished. He tore the veil, meaning we now have access to the presence of God. 
this curtain that had been protecting us from the deadly presence of God was no longer necessary because Jesus' death protects us from the deadly presence of God because he paid our debt. And now we don't bring sin with us in Christ to God. Because of that, this verse says, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, now we can go in. We don't have to be fearful. E even like the high priest wondering if he got it all done. Since we have confidence, our confidence in the finished work of Jesus, we can enter this holy place. We can come close to God. Since we have this great high priest over the house of God, we can continue to come close to God. This is a declaration of the gospel. We're invited to come into the presence of God. We're invited to stay in the presence of God because of what Jesus accomplished. This is the gospel message that God loved you so much. He knew you could never get your act together. He knew you could never get yourself saved. He knew you could never work off that debt of sin that you've racked up. And yet he still loved you. He loved you so much he sent his son who lived perfectly, died sacrificially, was raised victoriously so you can be saved. How? Next verse, verse 22. Let us draw near with a pure heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How do you draw near? First, it's by responding in faith to the gospel. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That's how you first draw near to God. It's accepting his gift of Jesus for you. It, it, it's experiencing the gospel. It's being saved. It's saying, yes, Lord, save me. And I believe you did it through Jesus and I accept what you have done. I'm gonna stop trying to save myself and instead I am trusting what you did through Jesus. And it, it doesn't stop there. It is a continued drawing near. Our, our hearts sprinkled clean, bodies washed with pure water. Again, more beautiful Old Testament Im imagery of what happened in the temple. You see, because of what Christ has done, your heart, Though it was cold and dead, it is now alive and clean. Your body, like some of our bodies show scars from the mistakes we made in the past. Like we damaged our physical health. We damaged our bodies. We, some of us have said, I am damaged goods. And yet in Christ, our bodies are washed with pure water. God doesn't see damage. He sees pure. Because of that, we're invited to respond in faith as we draw near and to keep drawing near. And in that, as you approach God, recognize, remember, realize, see that God sees that your heart is changed, your body is pure. As we were studying this passage, it was a real gift when Pastor Nathan said, I tend toward perfectionism. And because of my perfectionism, when I begin to approach God, I tend to feel shame. Like I'm not good enough. I'm not perfect enough. And it's a verse like this that reminds him and it reminds you that you can draw near to God because you are cleansed. It is safe. You are precious, beautiful in his sight because of what Christ has done for you. Draw near. But not just you. Here is the first of the three imperatives where we are told to do something that happens when we get together. So notice the phrase at the beginning of verse 22, let us 
draw near. Let us draw near. This, this is something we do together. This is not you draw near to God. This is let us draw near to God. That's why we gather together to worship. When we gather together to worship, we sense the encouragement, the inspiration by others who are there in the building. Even if you have wandered far from God that week, to be in a place where others are worshiping is inspiring. As they're drawing near to God, you want to draw near to God. I I remember when my friend Michael said, it was like the first time he ever came to one of our worship gatherings. He was not a believer in Jesus yet. He didn't hear a word I said in my teaching that day. And yet by being in the room, by being in the place where others were drawing near to God, he knew something really special was happening. And he would later draw near to God. If you have gathered in a public worship service, I'm confident you know how inspiring it is to see others drawing near to God. Hands raised, voices declaring, eyes closed, tears flowing, whatever it may have been. And in that act, you are inspired to draw near to God. So don't be surprised. In this season of 11 weeks of us not being able to do what we had been able to do, you may have felt yourself drifting. It's because you were built to draw near to God with other people. It's why we gather together. That's number one, let us draw near. Number two, we find it in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. He keeps his promises. He promised he would send the Savior. He promised that through this Savior, all would be invited to salvation. And of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, people will one day be gathered around the throne because Jesus saves. Read the story. God keeps his promises. Look back in your life. God keeps his promises. Because we can see God keeping his promise, we can take the challenge from God to hold fast. Hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering. And notice again, who is to hold fast? Us. Because it's something we do together This thing called faith is a team sport. It's not an individual event. We do this together. And so in the same way, many times we have have been in a place and we've struggled. And when we gathered, we saw other people holding to their faith and it inspired us. It reminded us of God's faithfulness and we were again able to believe. When do we have to cling to our faith? When something is pulling us away. I mean, we've had that in the last 11 weeks. Just chaos, things flipped upside down, real difficulties in our lives. Don't be surprised. Don't even be discouraged if if this has been a season where you have found yourself just having a hard time holding on to your faith. It's been chaos. And for many of us, we've, we've, we've been alone. The other time that it's important to hold on to your faith is when we're distracted. You're like, oh, I think I'll do this. And oh, what about that? And yet in times of distractions, we cling to what we know to be true. We do that together. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast to our faith. It's why we make sure we don't miss being together, gathered with other believers to worship our God, which takes us to our last one. Here's where we're going to have a little bit of fun. Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. All right, so let's talk about doing some stirring. This word stir, 
points to um, the action of urging, uh, rousing. Like you're going to get them excited. Uh, prod, provoke. I'm going to stoke his fire. Now, the problem with the act of stirring is that it can cause people to be aggravated at you. Like, ah, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. What are you doing? I, I, don't, I don't know that I want any of this going on in my life. Can you just leave me alone? Our students right now are doing a, a series called Love, Hate, where our leaders are challenging our students to have those conversations, even the difficult conversations, knowing that you might get called a Jesus freak. You might have a friend look at you and say, oh, who do you think you are, Mother Teresa? Yet we are commanded to do some stirring, some urging, some rousing, some provoking, but, but also recognize what this rousing is a provoking to, love and good works. This is not condemnation. This is not us going around and trying to fix everybody. This is not us running around and telling everybody all the things that they do wrong, like making their sin list. This is us provoking fellow believers to be the people God saved them to be through Christ. Like this is us looking at each other and and maybe our friends kind of eh right now. Maybe our friend's a little apathetic and really doesn't want to have a conversation about faith. But we're having the conversation of saying, I see this in you. I see the person God saved you to be. I see in Christ your potential and the gifts that you have. I urge you to be that person. It's not condemning It's up building. See the difference? And then, I love the first part. Let us consider how to stir up. This is premeditated. Like this means that you and I sit around thinking about the people that God has placed in our lives. Like we sit around and we're thinking about the people in our community of faith. We're sitting around thinking about the people we love and the people who love us. And we're actually asking God to show us, how can I stoke her fire? How can I urge him, provoke him to be the man of God that you saved him to be? Like we're sitting around and thinking about it. Which is really enlightening really enlightening. Like this will totally change the way you ever go to church again. You see, this passage is so much more than don't miss church. It's go to church with a mission. So when you wake up in the morning, when you get off work and you're headed out the door to go worship, that means you're on a mission. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to be considering how you can urge those friends in your life to lean into who God made them to be. Like you are ready to encourage, you are ready to exhort, even if they're not in the mood, like you are calling them out by lifting them up. So that means to get ready for church isn't just to get ready. To get ready for church isn't just to prepare your heart, Though both of those are a good thing, good steps in the right direction, it also includes premeditated thought about who you're going to encounter when you gather to worship with other believers. Because it is your mission to call them up. So when we put these three together, this whole don't miss church is because Draw near to God. Together. Hold fast to faith. Together. Stir up for good. Together. It is imperative that we be together so that we can draw near, hold fast, 
and stir up. It's what we do. And it's best done together. Man, when we're, when we're able to be together again like we used to be, it won't be like it used to be. It'll be, it'll be better. Because each of us will have in mind what it means to be on mission when we gather together. When we gather, you'll be thinking, okay, I'm ready to draw near to God and I'm gonna help some other people draw near. And then on those weeks that I'm struggling, their drawing near is gonna inspire me. And together, we draw near to God. Hold fast. Like together, we're gonna hold fast to our faith. And even on those weeks where I wandered far from God, I have my friends, I have my partners in ministry, and their holding fast is gonna encourage me to hold fast. And as I hold fast, I'm gonna challenge them to hold fast because God is faithful. And then when we gather to worship, we're all prepared. Maybe we even have notes and we're specifically thinking about who we wanna talk to so we can urge them up. Man, I cannot wait to be back together on mission with you. And then we don't have to wait. We can be in mission right now. Like, like look around, who's in the room with you? You are more important to them than ever because the rest of the group is not in the room with them. What you are doing in their lives is so much more important than when more people were in their lives because you know that other people aren't gonna have the chance to encourage them to draw near, to encourage them to hold fast, to encourage them to step up. You get to do that. Look around and they get to be that for you. Now look around again and, and think who's not here? Like who, who do I wish could be here? Be on mission. Even though we can't be in the same room together, you can still be the church together with me. Reach out, send a text, make a call and tell them what you see in them, that which God saved them for, that which God gifted them for, raise them up. Together, we get to do that. Together, we get to more fully experience what God has for us. I can tell you this. Our pastors, our elders, I am so excited about what God is doing in us. We are so filled with faith of what God is revealing to us, how God is challenging us. And I am so excited about what getting back together is gonna look like because I know the new normal is gonna be even better than the former normal because we're growing, we're seeing, we're clarifying, we're following him. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be really good when we're back together. And the beautiful thing is we can be together now, even before we get to all be back together again. Never again will you come to church and miss the opportunity to be on mission because now we know, now we know. And I know many of you have said, I will never take that for granted again. Thanks be to God. He has us on mission. Thanks be to God. We are again recognizing the blessing of being together on mission to worship our God. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this time that we have to gather, even to be together without actually being together, to be the church, without actually being in the church building. Lord, thank you for clarifying what, what we're about. Thank you for clarifying the mission that we're on. Thank you for helping us understand so we can share with a friend and lead our kids. And thank you for us that we would see clearly this mission that you have called us to. Oh God, I do pray in this season that your grace would abound upon your people's lives, that they would experience again a fresh taste of your goodness and grace, and they would be encouraged by your faithfulness. Lord, bring healing bring victory, 
bring deliverance from to your glory for your name's sake and the good of your people. And God, I do pray that in this season, you would be preparing us for the next, that with great clarity, we would come back together on mission. To you be the glory. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you read this passage, verse 25 ends with, and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's, there's been a lot of talk right now about the end of days, um, the end of time. And for some, that elicits fear. For some, it actually elicits condemnation, calling out all those sinners who are far from God. What it should elicit, stoke in us, is that we would all the more, all the more what? Draw near, hold fast, provoke to love and good works. In the, in the midst of this season, God is inviting us to get right with him and to help other people get right with him. God is inviting you today to draw near to him. If this is new for you, it really is as simple as believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. You can do that right now to declare to God, I actually believe that you sent Jesus to live perfectly, die sacrificially, be raised victoriously. I believe that. And today I declare Jesus is Lord of my life. I accept him as my savior. I declare him to be Lord. That's drawing near to God. And having drawn near to God, know that your heart has been cleansed. Your body is pure. There is no shame. Draw near to God and keep drawing near to him. And then we get to look around. Who's in the room with you right now? We get to help each other draw near hold fast and move toward love and good works. We're on mission today and we'll definitely be on mission when we get back in the same room together. Never again will we underestimate the importance of what it means to gather together. So now let's be on mission as we continue to worship together.